Lord, you are worthy of all, and you are. And I'm reminded of when years ago we were processing the, the realizing the error that we had embraced and we're trying to understand the the uh, the truth that you were that you were pouring out and we had all these booklets that we had to get rid of and we needed to have one that really described you properly and i remember the agony of, of trying to come up with a title and all these people week after week and finally the only title and people made fun of it at first, but we just realized the only title that really said it was God is, because that you are the sum of all things in every respect, on heaven and earth, in the visible and the invisible, in our personal human relationships. Nonetheless, you are all. So just ask that you bless our hearing today, that you bless the speaking, and uh, in this topic that we try to understand you more deeply and truly that you uh, that you curate uh, what is said and and take direction and just allow me to speak your words in Jesus name amen so uh, at Easter time during that season I, I gave a sermon about Jesus last words it is done and you know we processed how we tend to think that that was God. Uh, we talked about the issue of God being the idea that that many, many humans still have, and I, I know that I, I used to have, that God somehow could not could not condone, could not, or it, he doesn't condone, but he could not be in, in, in proximity, that somehow he just couldn't stand it, and that sin was always cast away. He could never be near the sin or... Uh, since we are all have that uh, problem once in a while, that would, by extrapolation, he couldn't near, be near us. How could we be near him? So we talked about that during that time and what that term actually meant. But I think it's worth processing that a little bit. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, you know, and I, I know I've shared this too. My, my view of human nature changed over the years, especially through my doctoral studies. I came into it believing that kind of assuming my, my assumption was human nature, you know, I mean, I, we know that we were not created depraved and evil, not something God did or would do. Um, and that, that's, that differentiates. There are still thousands, hundreds of thousands of Christians who, while they don't even think about it, many don't know the scriptures enough to even know that that's what their, their doctrine teaches, that humans are born depraved. Uh, but in actual fact, God said, uh, he had him. He says, this is good. You know, it's really good. And and our ancestors partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not of evil and evil. And uh, so something that God created to be good became corrupt. And really, uh, the, the from the very beginning of Genesis 3, the first Verse 15, the first prophecy is, is, is God telling us through Scripture that he will not allow that to, to rule and to dominate and to be the end of the story. That, there, that, he, that his whole plan is one of redemption to bring us back into the right kind of relationship with him. So sin has been an issue in humanity and something we've tried to understand is our relationship with God and you know it's something that at least in in my life I know intellectually but I have to re I have to kind of be reminded I came across a really interesting statistic reading a a a, a, a business book uh, and uh, the author had done a, uh, quite a bit of research into this and he said that the human that human minds that we tend to uh you know we start somewhere and then there there's a what do you call it there's a what do you call it in electricity when, or, uh, you know, various other forms of energy where you have us uh, over time, it just, you know, your battery in your car, you leave it there long enough and it drains. Yeah. Yeah. There's a natural, there's a natural depletion of energy. Everything's moving toward entropy. And evidently 
evidently in us, even, I mean, even in a healthy young state, the human mind tends to deplete its holding on to a vision or uh, a truth. And this author was recommending that, that, that CEOs and, and, and company leaders, that they actually do something overtly to refocus and re-energize um, their corporate vision and core values every 90 days. He said their research shows that, that people will get going on other things and basically will not have the vision that they may subscribe to, but it will not be right there front and center where they're thinking of it, acting on it, where it's second nature, even though they may start out that way. He said he, he found, and his research showed, that about every 90 days, it, begin, it, it's, it starts to get lost. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I don't know how true that is in other areas of life, but I do know that um, I do know that I need to be reminded and that there is a, even when I hold on to something extremely important, so my relationship, the relationship with God of human beings as it relates to sin, I think is something where there's a balance and, I, and I, that we need to kind of remind ourselves or be reminded uh, occasionally what that is. Otherwise, we can end up uh, like human nature at one extreme or another. Uh, the one extreme, one extreme being we're depraved, we're lost, we have, you know, we, we have no hope. Uh, the other extreme being, it doesn't matter. You know, Christ paid for our sin, so it doesn't matter. And uh, that can be a very dangerous uh, approach as well, because if we, if we start to think that God winks at or that he just simply gives sin a pass, then we start to live in a way that does not glorify him. We start to live in a way that actually begins to walk on his sacrifice. So what is the, what is the truth? What is the, you know, uh, I'd like to share a perspective with you on one part of that that has really helped me, I think, in, in, in having the appropriate and maintaining the appropriate mm -hmm. viewpoint. Because we know that God can be near sin and that he is near sin all the time. He was near sin, as we talked in the Garden of Eden, you know, uh, Genesis 3, verse 9. After they'd sinned, God initiated coming to them, and looking for them, and called to them, where are you? And uh, even in, for instance, in Job, chapter 1, verse 6, you can't get much more sinful than Satan himself. And here's uh, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, verse 6 and 7. And Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, well, hey, where have you come from? What, you know, what have you been up to? It was right there in the midst of the, the council. Uh, this is a God who does not, uh, you know, does not shy away or does not uh, remove himself from the presence of sin. So what does happen? Well, I think here, here's what's really, really helpful for me is to understand that when it, when it comes, when it relates to sin, or that proximity, and I guess you could also say sin and righteousness because obviously one is the, uh, one is the presence of something and the other is the lack of that same thing. Sin is the absence of righteousness. Anything that is not righteous is by definition sin. So anyway, uh, we need to, uh, it helped me a great deal to kind of understand that in, with that proximity as it relates to sin is a very different thing than intimacy when it relates to sin. Okay? Uh, as I said, sin breaks intimacy. It just does. I mean, what is the foundation we all know this. What, what is the foundation of human relationships between human beings? What, what must you have? If you don't have it, you really don't have a relationship, no matter what kind of hoops you jump through and, 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 and how you act and perform together. You don't have a relationship unless you have what? Trust. Yeah, 
which is based on honesty, right? Which is a form of love. Yeah, uh, trust. Trust requires on, honesty, and uh, if we don't have that, then there's then there's no basis. Well, what is honesty? I mean, what is the absence of honesty? Satan, the father of lies. It gets down to, it really, really quickly, it gets down to the actual character and personhood of Jesus Christ, of the Father, of the Spirit, on the other side of Satan or his demons. So proximity we don't find in the Bible, starting at the very beginning. Uh, it, before humanity, in the time of, as in the time that Job is writing about, uh, even you know, uh, even in the in the New Testament, we find in Acts, Saul you know was murdering Christians and trying to eliminate the church, pretty sinful, and he was heading to Damascus to do more of that. When the when when what we know who we know to be Jesus, simply blinded him with the heaven uh, light f from heaven. And uh, f he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who, and, and Saul asked, who are you, Lord? And Jesus said to this very sinful man that he's right there talking to, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. So Saul got up from the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand of Damascus, and for, for three days he was blind, did not eat or drink anything. And then, as we know, Ananias was called to anoint him, Saul was healed, he was converted, he was changed, and he became very intimate with Jesus. And uh, you know, and with the rest of the, the rest of the of the church at that time. He he became 180 degrees opposite. There was no point in there where where God pulled back proximity wise. But prior to that event, there was not intimacy between Saul and the Lord like there was after that fact, okay? Um, so sin is a disease. It is a disease, and it, it's contagious, we're told. A little, you know, as, as it says, a little bit of leaven, leaven's a whole lump. Sin is contagious. I mean, we just, you know, it, look at our brother Elric. You know, he didn't realize that he was maybe <laughs> that he was that he was being exposed to something from another person that they were carrying that is related very much to sin. Sin is a disease that spreads and does its damage in intimacy primarily, and sin breaks intimacy. It does not necessarily break proximity. Although in many cases in human relationships, the, the break of intimacy leads to a break of proximity as well. But it doesn't automatically. There are people who live in proximity to each other who had intimacy, who still live together in proximity where the intimacy is gone. And there are people who, through the grace of Jesus Christ, actually at some point, regain intimacy where it once was gone, where it had existed previously. So the disease, the ugliness, that part which God hates, you know, is not the sinner or the proximity to the sinner. That which God does not condone, that which God will not and cannot be a part of, is the and so the result is that there is a break in intimacy, and this is what this is what God was promising in Genesis three is that He would heal, He would heal that breach. He never, uh, you know, He never, He never ran from the whether it was from the you know Moses happened to be a murderer. I don't know if we we kind of forget that because he ended up such a great man, but he was a murderer. And a fugitive. <clears throat> and it was to that murder and fugitive that that God kind of cranked up a, a, a nice bonfire on this bush that he that Moses could see from the distance and 
And uh, for whatever reason, whether it was just curiosity or whether he thought, oh man, we got a, we got a, we got a brush fire starting here. I, it, you know, this could take us out. I better get over there. Whatever it was, it drew him to there. And that began a life of increasing intimacy between Moses and God. Uh, so his proximity, you know, the, look, think, about the, think about the Israelites. He led them out of Egypt. He worked incredible miracles, part of the Red Sea, destroyed the Egyptian army, funded them for, you know, created a huge trust fund with, uh, you know, a huge chunk of the gross national wealth of Egypt. And then he led them straight to Sinai, which wasn't that, you know, it was a pretty direct shot. And he called this huge festival, solemn assembly. Everybody get your best gear on, wash, fence in the animals, because your your God, you we're going to we're going to meet. We're going to enter into this wonderful relationship that I've that God has waited four hundred plus years from the time He promised Jacob what was going to happen. And now it's there, and God, with all of his glory and love and regalness, thunders from the mountain and, and offers this incredible, I mean, just read it, the incredible blessings of a covenant that he offered uh, with, with Israel. And what's the first thing they did when he finished speaking? The very first thing. They said, uh, please don't be so close to us. <laughs> We can't stand this. We 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 are not comfortable with proximity. Uh, be in close proximity with Moses, and let him be in close proximity with us. And uh, whew, don't know because that's that's I think that's how we got to roll, Lord. And even then, even then, he said, "This was after they." after they showed their real problem, which was one of a lack of intimacy with, with God and his ways, and they were far more intimate with the gods of Egypt. And after that episode was over, and the golden calf, then God began giving them, and this is basically the book of Leviticus, is a whole set of, of a whole process with all of its various forms and detail and, and liturgy, etc. But what was at the heart of it was the instructions and the, con the construction of the tabernacle. This was God's, was the one who initiated that. Why? Because he said, I want, I'm going to be. I want, this, I want you to be in a relationship with me, and as part of that, I want proximity. I want to be with you, and I will live among you as your protector, source of blessing. And so the, the tabernacle was created, and in that tabernacle was the holy place, right? And the holy of holies. <clears throat> and there was this curtain. I mean, you talk about a world-class historic uh, textile event. That curtain, you, if you, you know, Probably if you haven't reviewed it, you, the, you lose track of the size of that thing. 60 feet. I mean, okay, murals in the museums, you know, from uh, the tapestries, that's great. But try 60 feet, four inches thick. Just the weight of that thing. The weight of that thing, carting it around, you know. But those, 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 those Levites must have been buff. They had, they had, they they had several. They had several locations in their part of the camp of Levite fitness, <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, that was there to protect. So God would be in proximity, but protect them from death and danger. And so, if Israel had responded, the intimacy between them and the Lord would have increased. Just like it started to, when God told Moses, "Come on, bring seventy, get seventy of your of your leaders, you know, your the guys that work with you, and and bring them, bring them. Let's have let's have lunch, you know." And they did. This was this was heading toward closer proximity and deeper intimacy. Well, we know the story. Uh, 
that goes on from the whole time in the desert through the ups and downs and the times of righteousness and the following times of, of collapse of the nation and of morals and of, of, of sin and righteousness. And it's the same continued to the kings. Evil king, evil king, righteous king, evil king, righteous king, evil king, righteous, righteous king. All right on down till, till the whole, till God till God's said, okay, if we're not going to have intimacy, we're not even going to have proximity. And, you're, and he, he, sent, he allowed them to be taken into captivity. So um, we find that God gave a process in Leviticus, not only of the tabernacle, but also a process that's very clearly spelled out with a lot of detail and a lot of hoops to jump through to make it meaningful symbolically to the Israelites. But it was a very simple uh, principle spiritually. Okay? Even though there were a lot of washings and special robes and this kind of thing, the bottom line was that everyone was sinful. The priest and his family made sacrifices for their sin of repentance and atonement. They then made a sacrifice, and only the priest who had been cleansed was now qualified to go into the Holy of Holies once a year and to take this blood sacrifice of a perfect lamb and spread over the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, the, the symbol of God's presence in heaven and the, this heavenly throne, to sprinkle that blood and confess the sins of the nation. <laughs> and you know, there was a certain amount of drama to that thing because there was no guarantee in the people's minds humanly speaking, especially when they'd had a particularly sinful year, that, you know, they got forgiven last year, but were they going to get forgiven this year? And so the whole nation, with hushed tones, watched. And when that priest emerged, there was a yell that went up, and the shofars would blow, and the nation shouted as one because intimacy had been restored. Or as much as they would allow it, or proximity anyway, remained. And so that continued uh, even during that time, during the time of the Old Testament, where there was a process where Israel could be cleansed and return to protect the, both the, in, the intimacy and the proximity. And as long as they continued that, which unfortunately was not very long, you know, you find times, even in the times of the judges, where the, the tabernacle was was basically forgotten, run down. People didn't even know where it was. Um, so anyway, it's interesting, though, that later on in the story of Israel, in Isaiah 6, verses uh, 1 and also 5 through 7, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. This is Isaiah now talking about uh, how he became called to be a prophet. He said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined. I'm ruined, because I'm a man of unclean lips. Isaiah recognized, especially when he saw a glimpse into the glory and the righteousness of God, and the contrast with the earthly, he, he recognized that you know, there was that there was a breach here. And he said, I'm, I'm ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts, the one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal. This is, you know, it was, Isaiah's basically saying, Lord, you may as well take me out now. I, 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 recognize, I recognize what I deserve and, and how unworthy. And here came the seraphim, one of the uh, archangels, with a burning coal in his hands, which he'd taken from the altar that, that I, Isaiah saw, this heavenly altar. And he took it with tongs, and he brought it down, and he touched it to Isaiah's mouth. And he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. And this was... This was, you know, a, a, a visionary event, but it was also a very real event, and it's a very real prophecy or reminder 
that, that this method of cleansing is necessary, but also that it does exist in heaven, and it is going to be made available. And so Isaiah's experience was a prophecy of Jesus. And a time when there would be a way to heal the damage sin does to intimacy. For those who think the Lord could not be near sin, Jesus became sin. He became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, For our sake, he, speaking of the Father, made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see why I say it is, it is a terrible, terrible mistake. And I'll, I'll call it a sin because sin is, you know, the missing of the mark. Uh, but it's not something that we do as Christians, not something we do out of an intentional malicious spirit at all. It's, it's part of our humanity, but it's still something that is that is terrible and we need to be aware of if we allow ourselves to slip into this mindset of because God is so merciful and willing and because, because he is the incredibly loving, embracing God that he is, that we allow ourselves to think that he just simply gives sin a pass. That Whatever happened in heaven and the coming of Christ, all that changed the nature of sin somehow. That's how we can begin to think without even meaning to if we're not careful. In our prayers, in our, in our, in our introspection of, uh, you know, in the way that we view our life and our, 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 our walk. And it's wonderful. It is so wonderful to, to recognize that, that, in this, you know, in some particular way, we seriously miss the mark. We sinned, whether commission or omission. It is so wonderful to recognize that and know that you don't have to go get a calf, a cow. You just, you don't even have to necessarily, uh, at, you know, at, at that moment of recognition, drop to your knees. You know, you may be at work, and it's it's father, or as they like to say, dad. You know, papa. Uh, I just recognize. I just it just dawned on me. I did this, or I said that, or I neglected to, and that's terrible. It was not loving, and and to just simply acknowledge that and say thanks for your sacrifice and your love, and thank you that I don't have to beat myself over the head, go outside the camp till sundown, slaughter. You know, thank you, thank you for grace, <laughs> thank you for being who you are. But you see, the real energy there is who he is. Not that somehow he made sin not matter. He's always been a God who is not afraid or it's not, a, he's, he, he, he's, he's the, he's, it's not above him. He's willing to get down in the dirt with us and be in close proximity with sin. Jesus lived that life in every day of, you know, of the Gospels, much to the Pharisees, uh, you know, much to the Pharisees' uh, uh, chagrin. But there is a huge difference between thinking that sin does not break intimacy and that it's not something that has to be, you know, it was interesting in the song there, there was just that little flash, but <clears throat> there was that serpent there on the ground and there was its head getting crushed. That has to happen. That has to happen. Otherwise, the disease continues, and it's a contagious disease. So, righteousness, uh, you know, the, the state of him who is as he ought to be, you know, that's, we're not perfect. But by the grace of God, we are righteous when we're simply walking as we ought to be in our flesh, in intimacy with God. He said, and when Jesus had cried out again, Matthew 27, verse 50, when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, 
the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 60 feet long, four inches thick, ripped in two like it was a piece of paper. And the whole world was sent a message that you don't have to, you know, that you're invited to be intimate with God 24-7. First Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? It dwells in our midst here because it because he dwells in every one of us personally, which creates the dwelling in the midst. And the gift of intimacy, intimacy with God uh, is something that is so precious. It is so expensive that, uh, that I just hope, you know, that, that we can both uh, be lifted up by that fact and also maybe constrained in our thinking, in our, you know, if our thinking starts to lose that, that, that God will bring back, that that intimacy is not free, that it is a gift from God, and that it is because God is greater. He is, he, he is the God that will, that, you know, I'm tempted to say he's the God of sin, and in one sense he is, well, even though he didn't create it. But he's the God who is greater than any power on earth. He is righteousness. Therefore, sin will go. And intimacy will never be broken again. And you know, if you can imagine, even in, a, in, our, in our own life, if you can imagine <clears throat> now that most of us here have lived, you know, at least half or more of our life, I'd be generous. Um, <laughs> If we, if, if we could look back in our life and see and say and, and have felt that from this young age of coming to know Jesus, that we had been in this continual, continuous, not continual. We are in a continual, which means continually renewed when necessary, so it, can, it, it stays. But I'm talking about a continuous intimacy with God. Never broken by sin, never broken. You know, <coughs> some of us are old enough to remember Ali McGraw and and was it Ryan, whatever his face was, uh, love story. Well, no preppy love means never having to say you're sorry. Well, you know, but that's a, there's a truism. Jesus never had to say he was sorry to the Father because he didn't. Wouldn't that be an incredible walk? I mean, I'm looking what I can get through a week without having to say to God, I'm sorry. <laughs> without having just forgot to say I'm sorry. And then having to say I'm sorry about that. But, <laughs> but can you imagine an existence where internally, internally, we feel this deep, unbroken, timeless, boundless intimacy with God? But in addition to that, we, f we, we perceive in just as powerful and real terms this incredibly pure, unending, boundless intimacy with one another. Wow. That's heaven. That's the kingdom of God. It's only available in one place through one person. And sin is the enemy that breaks that and, and, and creates something ugly out of it. So sin, in my book, is not something, even though God almost makes it so by his mercy and his, his willingness to forgive and his tenderness and the fact that he doesn't beat us over the head with our sins like maybe our parents, our human parents, you know, may have, he doesn't. And as a result, it's really easy for us to, to then begin to think, well, well, you know, I guess it's not that, it's a problem, but it's not that big a problem. 